Today, my guest is Dr. Jeff Odristel. His motto is, I exist to help souls heal. He spent 25 years as a doctor, and now he's dedicating his life to healing souls. First of all, thank you so much for coming today because... I know it takes a lot of effort out of your time and your day because you're a busy person, but what prompted you to make a shift from healing bodies to healing souls? I had these profoundly spiritual experiences in the emergency department occasionally. Sometimes I would actually see people leave their bodies when they died and they'd communicate with me before they left that area, that realm, whatever. And I never spoke about it when I was seeing patients in the ER, just felt somehow like I couldn't talk about it. And then about six months after I stopped seeing patients in the emergency department, something just kind of clicked in my head and I felt like it was okay to talk about it. And that's when I started to share some of my spiritual experiences. And when I started to share them, people really resonated with them and they, they wanted to know more. And, I had some marvelous experiences where I helped people connect with their own spirituality and have their own aha moments. And I realized that I could still help people, help them heal their souls, if you will, even if I wasn't helping them heal their bodies anymore. Wow. That I find amazing that during your time in the emergency room, things occurred that helped you see that there was more than what meets the eye. Is that correct? Yes. For example, I uh, had a a patient that was flown in from a couple hundred miles away. Uh, He'd been in a car crash and and his wife had died in the crash and his uh, 14 month old son had died in the crash and he was very badly injured and he was flown to my facility. And when I went into the trauma room, he was unconscious on the gurney and a team of providers were taking care of him and standing above him in in the air was his recently deceased wife. And I experienced her presence and communicated with her uh, uh, while he was unconscious on the gurney. Wow. So had you had any prior um, connections with spirituality or interest in spirituality? Well, I didn't think so. Uh, it just kind of was a natural part of my life. It was who I was. And it wasn't until I started actually speaking about some of my experiences and people started asking me questions. Questions like, when did this start for you? And what happened that made this hap- this start occurring for you? And I'd never thought of that before. It just seemed like a natural progression in my life. But when I actually started contemplating it, I realized I think it all started when my brother died in a farm accident when I was 11 years old. I did read about that. So your brother passed away and clearly it had an impact on you. And can you share some of the experiences that you had that you feel opened you up to still being connected with your brother? I thought that I got through my brother's death without any major impact on my psyche. I didn't think it really had an effect on me until 20 years later when he came to me and he said, you have to go talk with our mother because there's things she's never told you about my death. And uh, you can imagine that got my attention. So I I went and had a visit with my mother. And that was the first time she ever told me this. She said, I always knew where you were in the house before Stan died because I could hear you singing. After your brother died, you stopped singing. And that was when I realized, oh, it it must have had a major psychic impact on me. It must have changed me in some way. A A few years after he died, I was 16. I was driving much too fast in a Volkswagen on a dark, windy country road with a couple friends in the car and nobody was wearing seatbelts, of course. And a voice spoke to me and said, you need to slow down. And there was something about the voice. It was more than a voice. It was like it wrapped itself around my heart. And for some reason, I I listened and I slowed down. I went around the corner and hit a Cadillac head on. Um, There was a lot of damage, but nobody was injured. And, And in retrospect, I think that I might have died that night if I hadn't have listened to that voice and slowed down. And it took me years to realize who the voice was. Um, 
that was a very rebellious time in my life. I, I wouldn't have listened to my parents or any authority figure. And I've joked that I don't think I would have listened to God if he'd have been sitting in the seat next to me. But there was one voice I trusted and I always listened to, and that was my brother. And I think it was my brother that saved my life that night. Wow. So hearing that experience about your brother passing away and it was an accident, that's what happened? It was. He tipped a tractor over. And then you almost being in an accident. Do you think that any of those events led you to become a medical doctor? I would like to say that I had some grand uh, uh, event that triggered my interest in medicine or there was some cosmic thing at work. And maybe there was, but it didn't feel like it at the time. I was walking along uh, the sidewalk with a friend of mine on campus, college campus. His dad was a doctor. He'd known his whole life he was going to be a doctor. I didn't know doctors' kids became doctors. Um, <laughs> but a lot of them do, apparently. And so I was walking along with him, and we were, I was a junior in college. And I said, what are you going to do when you grow up? And he said, well, I'm going to be a doctor. And he just said it matter-of-factly like everybody knew. And I thought, Oh, that sounds interesting. Maybe I'll try that. That was my decision to become a physician. Oh, wow. I love that. So spontaneous and just like, this is what I'm going to do. And maybe, maybe you did know on a different level. Maybe that's why it was so easy. But how great is that? You're walking around. And now I know that medical school is intense. And one of the things, um, well, I haven't gone to medical school, I imagine. But when I went to university for um, learning anatomy and physiology, they teach you a lot about what is real, what is not, what is science, what is not. And there's a very strong emphasis on evidence versus anecdotal information. So how do you mitigate that, being a medical doctor, fully educated in the Western world, and then spirituality? Well, the way I navigated it as a physician was um, I received these things as my personal experiences. And as far as I was concerned, they weren't imposed upon anybody else. I didn't need to share them. I didn't need to talk about them. Uh, they certainly weren't what we would call evidence-based or, uh, or supported by placebo-controlled double-blinded studies. <laughs> but that reviewed. didn't matter because they were for me and they changed who I was. And um, I still kind of deal with it that way. I, I don't uh, ignore or disregard my science training when I have these spiritual experiences. Um, but I recognize that sometimes things under that we can't explain and that doesn't make them less real. And so I'm comfortable with the two worlds meshing together because they feel to me to be complementary, not contradictory. And a lot of people don't realize that science is all about theory versus knowing. I, you know, I was surprised to learn that even the smartest doctors and scientists still don't know everything. So I, I'm glad that you are um, coming forward and sharing this information and that your mandate on your website is I exist to heal souls. Oh, I just love it. Thank you. You're welcome. That was given to me when I started doing the work I'm doing now. Um, I started thinking about how do I put myself out there? How do I uh, present myself to the world? And I have a friend who's uh, very talented and experienced uh, in the advertising marketing realm. And, and I talked with a couple of friends. There's a process you go through when you brand your business. It has to do with uh, what, am I, what do I have to offer? What is my competition? Uh, what is my competitive advantage? What do I want people to feel after they interact with me? There's a series of things you, questions you ask. And, mm -hmm. and I started to do that for myself. And it's mm -hmm. a very visceral thing when you're branding yourself. What do I put out there to the world? And in the process of doing that, that mission statement, that brief mission statement came to me because I had a business card and on the business card it said, I think it said physician, author, artist. I think I said that, or maybe one more thing. And I looked at it, I thought, that's not me. That's not all of me. Those are just parts of me. And that mission statement come to me, I exist to help souls heal. 
and you can do it through all these different avenues. Wow. And your website is amazing. If you haven't been to Jeff's website, you need to go and see it. It's there. And you're an author. Tell us about some of the books that you've written. Well, the book that you probably are familiar with and a lot of people are is a memoir I wrote that I told you about six months after I stopped seeing patients, I had this click and it felt like it was already all right to talk about things. And six months later, I'd written that book. And it deals a lot with one particular segment of my life. There's some things before and after that put it in context, but a lot of the book deals with just one year of my life. And it was the year I met that man whose deceased wife was standing above the gurney. He and I are still good friends now more than 20 years later. And it's, the title of the book is Not Yet, and it talks about some of my spiritual experiences and the impact they had on me and what I learned from those experiences. And, and when the book came out, I was just getting ready to go to my first formal uh, public speaking engagement uh, near Boston. And I was sitting in the airport, uh, and I had a stack of freshly minted books off the press in my bag, and this young couple came and sat down next to me and started talking to me and asked me the usual airport questions. Where are you going? What are you doing? And then they asked me what I was going to be speaking about. And when, they, when I told them the topic of what I was going to be speaking about, this young woman's countenance just changed, and she looked at me with the most sincere look and said, my grandfather just died, and he's come to me a couple of times. And my first thought was, why would you share something so personal and intimate with a total stranger? <laughs> and then I realized, oh, I'm a safe place. She knows she can trust me. And, and she took one of my books. She bought a book and went and caught her plane, her and her husband. And uh, I'd been an emergency physician for 25 years at that point. I, I estimated I'd seen in excess of 60,000 patients. On the plane to Boston, a voice spoke to me and said, you will help more people with this book than you helped as a physician in the emergency department. So that changed my, my perspective. It, it, it gave me purpose for the next however much segment of my life, what I'm going to be doing. That makes me really emotional. <clears throat> it's wonderful that you're doing that. And I think that that's called, at least that's what I call life purpose, like, like God's work and coming forward and obviously you were doing God's work as a physician but now as you stated you were healing bodies you're now healing souls so tell me about this journey that you've been on you've been talking on stages and you've been sharing your books and I know that you have a wide repertoire of books they're all leaning towards spirituality but can you speak to those as well Yes, uh, a few years ago, I wrote my first novel. And it starts out as a pretty gritty kind of an action sequence. But really, what it's about is a soul that's so broken and so separated from the world because of his alcoholic abusive father, that he hates the world. And, and it turns out to be a very spiritual journey for him. He meets somebody that actually loves him the way he deserves to be loved. And uh, he uh, finds out things about his father he never knew that able, enable him to completely change his life. And I wrote a series of six children's books. Um, I was riding in the car with my granddaughter a few years ago. She was just three at the time. And she said, Papa, tell me a story, because she loves stories. And I was in the car, so I had to make it up. So I made up a story <laughs> about Mutt the Duck. And she was telling it in such detail. Three days later, my wife said, Jeff, you just have to write that down. So I wrote it down. And, and then I found an illustrator. And it was so much fun to make the book. Uh, I made five more of them. So there's a series of six of them. I feel it's really important to diversify your spectrum of talents when you have so much like you do. Um, so that you can meet people where they're at. And, and oftentimes people will comment underneath the channel, well, so-and-so did this, but I don't do that. The fact is, is that each person that has transformative, profound experiences like you have, when they come forward and they show up, you're meeting people who need to hear you. So that's great that you're doing it with children, with people who read novels. And the story, that novel that you wrote, I imagine someone reading it could apply those lessons or that wisdom to their life. I think so, yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, 
it, it it's set in Europe. It's a it's a guy that and I wrote it while I was in Europe doing business for several weeks. And so all the places in the novel are places I've been. And uh, he writes on a train, and I did I wrote much of the book on a train in Europe, traveling between cities. And yeah, I think it's relatable, and and it's got a message that I think can resonate with everybody. It doesn't matter how badly you're broken. There's a path to to wholeness, uh, and I think that's the overall message. Speaking of that, knowing a little bit about you, you were a rebel, you're uh, a grandfather, you've obviously gotten married somewhere along the way. Tell me a little bit about your personal journey with spirituality, where there might have been some tension or growth. One of the most difficult and challenging uh, parts of my life, and sometimes I don't share this because it's so it's so hard to uh, to get your arms around, but I'll give you the very short version. Um, I was in a public place one day, and this woman walked up to me and she says, "Where do I know you from?" It was that conversation, and uh, we figured it out finally where we'd connected a few years before. And as we started talking, I learned that her husband had just died in a car crash about six weeks before. And she had, they had six children. The, first, the the youngest one had just been born a few weeks before he died. And I could feel the weight of the grief and the sorrow of this mother. Uh, she had one of these uh, relationships with her husband that you read about in books and see in movies. You know, it was just bigger than life. And, and I could feel it. And one day... No, uh, so f a few months later, I was driving home. I call her Rebecca in the book. I, that's the name I use in the book. And I was riding home from the hospital in the middle of the night after a shift. And Spirit spoke to me and said, is Rebecca's family less important in my eyes than yours? And I said, well, no, of course not. And Spirit said, then why should they be in yours? And I thought, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> we're, we're talking about my wife and children. They have to be my first priority. And as I'm rationalizing this, I had this download and I was moved upon by spirit at the moment. And I asked, I said, can I take some of Rebecca's spiritual burden and carry it for her for a while? And surprisingly enough, the answer was yes. And that horrible, dark, sad grief and loneliness that was her life settled onto mine. And it went on for about four and a half to five years. Um, it was so bad at one point, I was in my house going about my business and it got so heavy I had to sit down because I thought I was going to fall. And the foreboding just closed in around me until the, it seemed just heavy and black and I thought I might die. Mind you, I'm an emergency physician. I literally mm -hmm. thought I might die. Wow. And in that instant, the voice spoke to me and said, this is how Rebecca felt the day her husband died. And so I was given this profound level of empathy for this soul. And I was permitted to carry some of that burden for her for a time. And one time I poured out my soul to heaven and I asked if I couldn't be done with this. Cause it had been going on for a couple of years. And uh, uh, in retrospect, it was kind of a attempt to renege on a promise because I, she hadn't asked me to do it. I had volunteered, right? Uh, her husband hadn't come back to life. She hadn't had, she had no way out. And here I was asking for a path out. And the answer was not yet. That's the title of my book. That's where the title comes from. Got it. Got it. And so six months or a year later, I had lost hope. I was in the darkness and uh, being without hope is a horrible, horrible place to be. And I, I, I poured out my soul again and asked the same question about, extricating myself from this horrible circumstance and I was shown a path and I could see this light and I was told how I could the steps I could take to be to be done with it and I was given permission to go and then the voice said but if you want the greater blessing endure it for now wow. and that's as, as as horrible as that sounds that's the day I got hope back because I realized there was a presence that cared more about me than I cared about myself, that knew me better than I knew myself, and that had a path and a plan for me that was based in love and compassion. And so I, I held on, and I, finally, I found my way out gradually, and things worked out well. And it was right about that time when I met 
this man whose wife was killed in the car crash. And he and I became good friends. His name's Jeff Olson. We speak together frequently. And uh, that was when I met him. And the first real conversation we had after he got out of the hospital, um, I came home that night and wrote in my journal that I was grateful for my years in the darkness because I knew the answers to his questions and I knew how to help him. Yeah. So uh -huh. Even our blackest times, they're there for a reason. They're there to prepare us. They're there to give us an experience to enable us to have empathy. So that was one of my most challenging spiritual times. Mm, wow. That was very profound. And uh, I suspected it was Jeff Olson. I feel like you, um, this is a feeling that you are filled with compassion. And I think you've probably been working on compassion and empathy for longer than this life, maybe even before. And I feel that that's, I feel like your whole life is dedicated to compassion, empathy, uh, showing a good example, living a life that really helps people and heals and helps them give them hope and faith and to carry on and to heal and that it's okay and you're going to be okay. Is that how you feel? That is how I feel. I've struggled. I struggled for decades to try and develop more compassion, more love, more unselfishness, all of those things. And I worked on it consciously for decades. And uh, I had a profound spiritual experience one day where I had this breakthrough and I understood it. And, and I was given to understand that the whole struggle for all those decades was to teach me about people that struggle to love so that I could understand them and help them. Uh, the primary purpose of every experience is to enable you to help someone else. You get the secondary benefit of personal growth. Right. 180 degree shift in my perspective there about why we go through rough times and why we have experiences uh, is to prepare us to help others. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Um, and I resonate with that because the first part of my life, I had one career. The second part of my life, I had another, which I never understood until now. And this is my third part of my life, which I feel, and now I'm dedicating it to sharing what I've learned and to creating a platform for people like you to share it with as many people as possible because I recognize that my little story is just one, but if we put all of these amazing stories together, it creates a big flame of hope and change. I think you talking today is like a healing bomb for those who hear you. Well, thank you. That's why I do it. I met with a client last night. We had a great session. Uh, we worked through some issues that she was struggling with. And I got a text message from her today. She said she had a big aha moment this morning. She got a message that was clear to her. It opened up a, a, a new path for her and, and she was moving forward. And I told her, I said, this is why I do what I do. It makes me so happy when people get a breakthrough and if I can help them find that breakthrough, that's what I'm trying to do now. So do you do spiritual counseling or spiritual coaching currently? Can people come to I you? Do. On I, like you say, I write a lot. I speak a lot. But I also do one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring with people, I, uh, intuitive or spiritual mentoring. People are more connected to spirit than they realize. Even people who sit down with me and tell me they've never had a spiritual experience, when we start talking and I lead them uh, back in their life and help them realize, and they kind of go, oh yeah, I recognize that now. And I help them connect with spirit in a way that they can get their own answers. I, I'm not one of these people that tries to give people answers. I connect them with spirit and their own spiritual gifts so that they can get their own answers and trust them. And I help people realize that they themselves are divine beings, that they're connected. And, and when people think that they're hearing their own voice, that's okay because it's still divine, even if it's your own voice. Yeah, there's a lot of amazing things about you and your story, but that to me is the most amazing that you have that connection, that seamless connection with your source, your creator, God, 
love and that you're literally um, listening to that, tuning in with your intuition, listening to that voice and taking action on that voice and trusting that voice. I think, I think that's what I call faith. I, I agree. And it comes with practice. Some people think that spiritual gifts just come upon us perfected and ready to be exercised. And they forget that, you know, you can be born with a musical gift, but you still have to practice 40,000 hours to become proficient, right? You, exactly. you, you can go out for the football team and have an athletic gift, but you still have to practice every day with the team. Yeah. And spiritual gifts are the same way. They come upon us sometimes gradually and slowly and we have to work on them on a daily basis and we do little things on a daily basis that allow allow us to grow into our gifts i was uh, just the day before yesterday i think it was i was out for a walk and sometimes i get good information when i'm out walking or riding my bike um and and i got this download of what i needed to say but i wasn't told who to say it to and when I got back from my walk, I got a text from a person and they asked me a question and it was exactly the answer that they needed that had been given to me an hour before the text. You know, doesn't that give you confidence in life? Doesn't that make you feel just like you can breathe easy and that you're paying attention to that voice? It helps me, yes. And when I first started doing my mentoring, I would only do it in person, face to face, because I thought I could only feel it and experience it when I was in front of the person, talking with them in person. I had a woman in Texas uh, who couldn't travel to where I was, but she really wanted to have a session, so I finally agreed to do it by phone. And I had a wonderful spiritual experience talking to her by the, on the phone. Mm -hmm. A few days later, I was texting with a friend of mine in Hawaii who was going through some really rough times. And literally in the middle of the text, I was given what to say in the text. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh, maybe I don't have to be there in person with them. Maybe it doesn't matter what medium I'm using to accomplish uh, what needs to be done. And now I have clients all over the world that I meet with via technology in Australia, Canada, Mexico, South Africa. And it's wonderful. And you know, I don't have to be there in person, I finally realized. Along those lines, I've got a question for you. Frequently, my YouTube viewers will say, um, I wish I could have an NDE or I wish this could happen to me. I have not experienced an NDE, but I find my dream experiences to be highly transformative. And the same is with you, right? I mean, here you are, this amazingly spiritual being guide, and you've not died <laughs> as far I've as I know. Died. And I can tell you, and I have a lot of friends in the near-death experience community, uh, many of them New York Times best-selling authors, you'd know their names if I said them, and they all agree with me. Uh, if you can have your spiritual experience without dying, that is preferable. <laughs> you don't have to have a near-death experience to have a spiritually transformative experience. Uh, it can come in small whispers, it can come in dreams, it can come in visions, um, I've had uh, even out-of-body experiences. Uh, it, w it was only uh, less than two years ago that my brother came to me again. I was in meditation and he took me by the hand and the walls and the ceiling of the building I was in just faded away and he led me through some profoundly glorious place that I think a lot of people might describe as heaven. And he showed me my life in review and he showed me the days in my life where my course had, my trajectory had taken a significant turn he showed me that it was him that had intervened on those days on my behalf then he showed me the day that he died which i'd experienced so many times i it, it's vivid in my mind but he showed it to me from the perspective of our parents and i felt what my parents felt that day then he said to me go tell our parents not to be sad anymore I'm okay, and I want them to be happy when they talk about me. Oh, wow. I, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because so many people carry on and they feel that they need to carry on. They almost feel obligated to be in grief. There's a feeling, and you, it's hard to understand unless you've been through grief and really felt mm -hmm. it, but there's a, there's a part of us that feels like if we start to live again, 
it sounds somehow disrespectful to our deceased loved yes. ones. That's we're happy right. again that somehow we're not grieving for their absence. Uh, and, and there's this real sense of refusing to move on because it seems to give this sense that we're forgetting them. But that's not how they feel. They don't want us to be sad and in grief. They're fine. They want us to move forward and they want us to be happy when we remember them and talk about them. That's my experience. I'm saying. So I, my father had passed away and I hadn't heard from him and I anticipated having a dream from him. And finally, after I think it was, I can't remember, a week or a month, it, to me, it seemed like an eternity, like he should have been there pronto. Um, I dreamt of him, but he wasn't smiling and he wasn't happy. He was turned to the side and I'm like, hey, dad, so good to see you. You look great. You look healthy. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, you died of cancer. And I started sobbing uncontrollably. And then he shifted and looked directly at me. He said, stop, stop this because you're only crying for your loss, Sylvia. I'm fine. And the worst part, he conveyed this not in words, but through telepathy. The worst part is that I keep having to come back down here every time you're sobbing like this. And he said, I have a lot of work to do. And I didn't really understand all this a lot of work to do. I'm like, well, me, you know, like, he goes, no. He said, it's your turn to be the parent. That was it. And after that, I just tried as hard as I could not to grieve anymore. That is so beautiful. I'm so glad you shared that. Uh, you know, Jeff Folson, my good friend, had a similar experience with his wife. And she came to him and uh, said, you, you need to move on. You know, I, I'm fine. You, you need to move on, too. Um, yeah. And I've had a, I have a lot of friends who've had those kind of experiences. I imagine that with a husband and wife situation, it's kind of, there's a lot more guilt to it. You expect your parents to pass away, but you never really expect your spouse to pass away. And uh, I understand that you've also been married for 30 or more years. Yes, I'm, I'll be coming up on my 35th wedding anniversary uh, in 2021. Congratulations. Uh, we have five kids and now five grandkids. And uh, we've shared a lot of experiences together and uh, been able to, to make things work. That's kind of unusual in this day and age for uh, to be in a marriage that long, but we're still happy and together. And there's two, two in the same interview. I also have been. And I want to speak to this since there's both of us here with the 30 plus. Um, I wanted to talk about what it takes um, if you're watching and in a marriage every single day isn't a bowl of cherries and i'm sure there's plenty of days where you just say oh, what have i got myself into and i feel like um i feel like it's a good thing to share with people that we're learning and growing and i take my spiritual experiences into my marriage experience like i'm learning spiritual experiences and how to be the best version of myself through those situations. How about you, Jeff? I, I agree with you. Uh, in some ways, marriage is a workshop to learn how to improve yourself, how to get along with others. And one of the things that I, I think is really important is it moves us along the path of accepting other people the way they are. A lot of people go into marriage thinking they're going to change their spouse and uh, everything will be wonderful. And as we grow together, we learn, wait a minute, they're not changing. They're not going to change. They're fine the way they are. It's me that needs to be more accepting. It's me that needs to change a bit. And this is a good metaphor, a good practice for life, because one of the challenges I have with a lot of uh, religious traditions and faith systems is the rigidity with which they impose their beliefs and their practices on their adherents and even others. And I've come to the point where I am inclined to think that everybody is on their path and their path is fine for them. It's the path they're supposed to be on. And when I finally got to the point where I could observe somebody else on their path and say, I don't understand your path, but I don't have to. It's not my path. I don't have to judge it. I don't have to explain it. I don't have to rationalize it. All I have to do is honor it. It's your path. And when we get to that point in the marriage, as well as in a larger community, then we can live in greater harmony and respect and honor people much more completely. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think there's a tendency to want to say, oh, this is not working out 
Okay. So again, this is not a judgment and let's remember the word judgment because that's my next question, but you, uh, okay. I don't think it's a good idea to throw something away because a part of it needs work. I think that it's a good idea for your own spiritual evolution, not to be good or not to say that you've got all these years behind you. But I think from a spiritual standpoint, uh, for your own evolution, if this situation is presenting itself in front of you, it's something that you need to pay attention to, I think. I agree completely. Things are in your path for a purpose. Right. And the problem with judging them is there's no way uh, there's no way you can judge it objectively, and we're not good judges mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we label things, and we label them as good and bad or right or wrong. And the problem is you can't label them until you first judge them. And once you've judged them and labeled them, then you don't have to deal with them anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If, you, if mm -hmm. I've decided, for example, alcohol is a bad thing, therefore people that drink alcohol are bad people. I'm not going to I'm not going to interact with people who drink alcohol. And we've placed all this judgment on it because we've already prejudged them and labeled them. Mm -hmm. and we do that with so many aspects of our life and what we interact with. And often our labels are wrong. Yes, and also, also our lab our labels and our judgment have um, a certain degree of power if the person who, whom you're judging is susceptible or weaker. And I feel to give people the grace and compassion and room to be who they are. I mean, I'm not saying I do this all the time. I try. I try because in my mind, I automatically want to make an assessment judge, assessment judge dismiss, assessment judge dismiss. However, I recognize that uh, that's not very charitable, but I just do the best I can with the situations that do arise. But on, in the beginning, and I want, I want to know how you felt, but in, in the beginning of my spiritual journey, I thought, don't judge. It's bad to judge. <laughs> don't judge. Us. But that was judging myself for judging. Now I realize, oh, it's a colossal mistake to judge, first of all, because I don't want to learn that experience. And I find that every time I judge something, smack right in the face. I have to learn it. I don't want to just, I just want to give people the freedom to grow and some room and space to be whom they are. And actually I might even benefit if I could just sit back and accept them for who they are. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Uh, and like you said earlier, I try to meet people with it where they are and I don't, I don't care where they are you have to connect with people where they are. Um, I, I had a, an experience about 35 years ago, I think it was, uh, I, I was with a very spiritual person, a man that was much older than me. I really respected him. He was very knowledgeable and he offered to give me a blessing. And I said, okay, sure. I love that. And he, he, he put his hands on my head and he pronounced a blessing upon me. And in the blessing, he told me, Teach people the truth in such a way as to enable them to realize they've always known it. See, it's not about forcing things on people. It's about helping them come to their awareness and, and recognition of what they already know. We're just helping them remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and sometimes we forget that when we interact with people and, and we, we judge them. Like you say, we, we, we assess, judge, and dismiss. I thought that's a good way to, of summarizing it. Ironically, the master, Jesus Christ, you know, his caution was, you know, don't judge anybody. Judge not that you be not judged. Exactly. And uh, when my friend Jeff Olson was in another realm, when he had his near-death experience, he was viewing much of his life and some of the things he felt he did wrong, some of them he felt he did wrong, even though he knew they were wrong, and he was feeling bad about, the, about it and wondering if he could ever be forgiven. And his, his guide said, those are ju your judgments, not ours. We don't view things that way. Uh, there's nothing to forgive. Everything's in perfect order. Some people would argue, if you do something and you have an untoward outcome, if you learn something from it, then it wasn't a waste and it wasn't a mistake because it's about what you learn. We get this misperception that we're here to do everything right. It comes a lot from religion that you should never do anything wrong and you shouldn't sin and you're here to do everything right. And we forget that the express purpose of being on earth 
is to be mortal. And it's to make mistakes. If you weren't going to make mistakes, you wouldn't be here. There'd be no purpose in it. If you're not going to be mortal, there's no purpose in being in mortality. People yes. think that being mortal somehow makes them bad, but it doesn't. Being mortal does not make you less divine. True. So uh, with that, I've got a spin on it. I've thought a lot about religion and the roles that it plays. And um, I do feel that there's room for religion. If you look back, for example, at the uh, Dark Ages um, or just before the Dark Ages, around the time where people were more barbaric, um, how they wouldn't think twice about going to a village and killing everyone and, you know, uh, pillaging. Now, uh, I think in that context, religion gave some kind of framework. Mind you, half the time it was because of religion, but I, I try to justify that religion gives some people a hook to learn. For example, if it wasn't for Christianity or Catholicism, I wouldn't know about Jesus. It was there that I learned about Jesus. So I feel like there's room for it, but I also feel like it needs to be less judging. And I know we're, going, we're treading on um, dangerous ground here because people feel very strong about their feelings. But I'm in agreement with you. I do feel that you can make mistakes. I've come to the conclusion that being fully who you are, loving other people like you love yourself. I mean, who said that? Right, Who's right. <laughs> I agree with that wholeheartedly. And you know, um, there's a lot of people that say really harsh things about religion and some of those harsh judgments may be warranted and some of them maybe not. In my, when I'm feeling compassion about religion and I want to look at it from a positive perspective, I believe it's religion is intended to teach us how to love. The reason you gather together is to be empathetic to people and to just support them and to love one another. The reason you don't go out and steal is because you're, you love the people, you don't want to steal from them. If you look at all the things that in religion from a more compassionate perspective, they're all exercises in how to teach us to love. But sometimes they go awry and the people that, uh, that, it, that latch onto them tightly misuse them. And so it, it's there for good and bad, but I think it's well intended generally. Yeah. Exactly. I think we're also in the middle of a revolution and it's a spiritual revolution. And I think that you're part of it. And I think that we incarnated to become part of that enlightening movement more than ever before this enlightenment, perhaps in the Renaissance, there was another movement where there was a lot of art and uh, social enlightenment. And right now there's a lot of spiritual enlightenment. And with COVID being prominent, I think it's really put an emphasis on people stopping and thinking about what their philosophy on life is and what the potential for mankind is. Uh, I feel very sad that there has to be so much commotion, negative commotion. And I'm not even saying that it needs to be that way in a revolution. I wish that everyone could have great conversations like these ones and discuss their their true feelings and connection with God. I, I mean, that's my hope. What about you? I agree with you. One of the interesting ironies of COVID is that it's precluded people in, in large measure from gathering to worship. And it's put the onus of uh, your connection with heaven on your you as an individual. I've for a long time felt that it's important that we don't confuse spirituality and religion. Uh, spirituality right. is uh, much more uh, a one-on-one -on -one connection with source it's about uh, finding your purpose and living your purpose and honoring uh, the gifts you've been given to a, the greater good and I, I like your comment about a, a, a cultural renaissance at, at one time and now a, more of a spiritual renaissance I, I like that it, that feels good to me Oh, thank you. And I often think about Jesus and um, what religion he had to hang on to. I mean, he was Christ. He was in tune directly with God and nobody was telling him except for God and the angels guiding his path. So, I mean, that's who, who we have, God and the uh, angels guiding our path. I, I recognize that everybody is where they're at 
and I honor that and uh, I'm happy that they're there. And even in my lifetime, I've been in different places. If I could meet the Sylvia who was 16, there'd probably be <laughs> some differences. So yeah, there's an evolution in it. I'm grateful for people like you that are coming and writing books and talking and and I think with you in particular, you're meeting people who perhaps do have a medical background or that type of background who have had experiences who can say, well, you know, Jeff came out, uh, Dr. Jeff came out and he talked about it and it gives permission for people in that realm and that scientific background to say, it's true. <laughs> you know, there is a God. I, I um, frankly, I'm in the process of organizing a, a conference about the medical perspective on near-death experiences. It's intended to be science-based, uh, looking at the published uh, peer-reviewed literature. It's to be for physicians, by physicians. All of the panel, all, all of the speakers are MDs and MDs. And uh, it's been accredited for continuing medical education. So I'm really looking to reach out to the medical community and, and tell them what we know and what we don't know and be very candid about what we don't know, which is a lot. Uh, and I, I've, I've postponed the conference. I haven't set a date for it yet because I want it to be an in-person conference that uh, fosters networking and, and research. Uh, and I think that's not done well on Zoom. So mm -hmm. when, when the pandemic comes enough, I'll set a date and uh, move that forward to the medical community. So just so my audience knows, they can connect with you through your books on your website. They can come and um, get spiritual coaching. And I understand what you said, you, you help them connect with their source. Um, and is there a message and, and more that you would like to share with my audience? That's a good question. As a matter of fact, yes. Um, a couple of years ago, I was preparing to go speak to a large group of people. And I take this very seriously. I tried to get centered and connected. And I asked, what is the message? And I came in a very clear three-part message. Tell them they're enough. Tell them they're divine. Tell them they're loved. That was the message. And I've delivered that message a few times since then. And uh, I think it's a powerful message. It helps us realize who we are. It helps us step into our divine nature. And it helps us to get over some of the insecurities that the world would put upon us by not realizing who we are. I feel honored to have met you today. And I feel honored to have this conversation and to share it. I can't wait to get in and edit it and upload it online and share it with everyone. I want to thank you so much, Jeff, for coming here today. And uh, yeah, thank you. It's so wonderful to be with you. Thank you for having me. I, I love to, to share and talk with people and uh, do whatever I can to, to move people forward a little bit. And so if I can contribute in some way, I'm honored to do it. Yeah, and I'll put all of the information of how to contact you, um, Jeff, Dr. Jeff, in the show notes, in the description of this video. So if you enjoyed it, let us know, comment below, and questions too, if you have questions. So thanks so much for watching, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed this interview as much as I did.